beyond Welcome back this week, everyone, to another edition of Beyond 3D, coming to you live from the RPP studios on the Mornington Peninsula, 98.7, 98.3. Good evening, Matt. Clint, how are you? Good. Oh, what a week, huh? Tell me about yours. Oh, it's been very interesting this week. Oh, I would want you to tell me it there, was boring. <laughs> yeah, you tell me about it. There, well, we all know they had the terrorist attack in London this week, but in my opinion... Was it really? Yeah, in my opinion... That was the second terrorist attack of the week because the first one happened in Washington, D.C. Tell us all. Well. Because I'm sure some people aren't clued up. Well, the Congress, the House of Representatives, at least part of the Congress, had hearings on he who shall not be named and whether or not his tweets were accurate, valid, and what have you. And what came out of those hearings was the fact that, in fact, he was a lying sack And the other thing was... Do I, hang on, hang on. I, I just bleeped that in time. You're very lucky. Yeah, thank you. And the other <laughs> thing was... <laughs> I had to say it. And the other thing was the fact that there is an investigation by the FBI into the Russian connections with he who should not be named organization. That's just a big pile of messed up spaghetti, isn't it? Yeah, crazy. But That wasn't the big deal. Most people knew he was lying about those tweets. And the other thing is, people basically had come to the conclusion that there was something going on with the Russians. That wasn't the big thing. The big thing was having that hearing, having the FBI, having the NSA, having the Justice Department all say that this is going on. But the thing that was the big, big, biggie was the fact that there is a new whack job in town. And his name is Hang Devin, on. his name is <laughs> his name is Devin Nunez. Okay. Or Nunez. Okay. Yes. Like I, I wasn't even going to go down politics road tonight, but you've been like a dog with a bone all week. I had to. Um, all week. Honestly, guys, this to me was one of the most incredible things I have ever seen politically in Decades. I'm just going to dial up. I think I might go Galaga tonight. <laughs> no, 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 no. I won't take no, that much more time. It, go, it's go. really straightforward. This guy is running an investigation. The investi- who, who is he? Devin Nunes is a congressman, and he represents the state of California, and he is a Republican. He also was a member of Trump's transition team mm-hmm. after the election. And they had to get ready to move in to the executive branch. Mm -hmm. He is the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. Moxie moron, yes, but what are you going to do? Now, they had the hearing. FBI Director Comey, NSA Director, the DOJ all stated that no information was found about bugging of Trump Tower. But... There was information about possible collusion with Russia. Mm -hmm. You're investigating now your former employees. I can see where this is going. You're investigating your former employees. You're doing this. Your former, let's not not employees. Your former colleagues in the transition team, and you are in charge of this investigation. Now he's done some nefarious things along the line already. No. Yeah, but. What was interesting was what happened our Thursday morning, United States Wednesday night. He said that he was given some information about FBI, um, NSA, how do I put this without being crazy, intelligence that people were what they call unmasked. In other words, they, the United States can basically bug a phone on somebody. Of course they can. All right, well, they can surveil. What happens in a nutshell is this. Let's say you are from Afghanistan and you are an ambassador. The United States can track or monitor your phone calls to see who you're talking to, what you're talking about. Pine Gap has to have something to do. Yes, they do. Now, good point. Now, what happens is this. If during that conversation, a U.S. person is named, any U.S. person, Uh they have to mark or hide the name of that U.S. person. So that that person will be called person number one. 
U.S. person number one. They could talk about five people, it'll be U.S. persons one through five, depending on what the conversation is about. Now, if they actually, during monitoring this Afghani ambassador, get a phone call from a U.S. person, they do the same thing. They mark the name. It is not revealed to the public. You have to protect United States citizens. Fine. This is the whole thing that happened with General Michael Flynn. His name came out on the fact that he was dealing with the Russian ambassador. That's how that basically happens. They get surveillance material and his name was mentioned or he was involved in a conversation and they can they can hide his name or reveal it depending on how his name was supposedly leaked and that is the whole problem right now. I digress. The head of this committee, the chairman of this committee, got some information about what was going on with all of this stuff. And instead of giving the information to the ranking member of the Democratic part of that committee or any other committee member, he holds a press conference, talks to his Republican counterpart, who is the Speaker of the House, and then runs as fast as he can over to the White House to tell them all of the information that he found before he even let the committee know. What he has done... I know what he's done. ...has totally and unequivocally blown up yes, this investigation. hang on a minute. I know nothing about what you're talking about, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting here listening to you explain the machinations and the processes that this guy has gone through, mm -hmm. and I can tell by what you've told me, he hasn't gone through the correct chain of command, has he? If you... Yes or no, Matt? He has not. Okay, hang on. If you were an investigator, if you were an investigator, and your group of investigators is investigating the mob, and you get information about your investigation. I'm you don't take it to your investigating friends or your colleagues. You go with it to the mob. Yeah, but hang on a second. He must be sitting on something pretty big to decide to share it with his counterpart and run straight to the White House for a press conference. He didn't share it with his counterpart. He didn't tell his counterpart at all. He just went straight to his former employers at the White House to let them know what was going on. I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah. Go ahead. He's not following correct protocol. Mm -hmm. Why would you break correct protocol unless the information you had was too great not to risk having it redacted or altered or disappeared? That's a very good question. And most of the people are saying he did it for party political purposes. Incorrect. No, very no. correct. Do you, that's what you believe? Yeah. How do you know this? Very simple. <laughs> when he had his press conference. I'm going to hold you accountable to these things. When but, he hang had on, man, his hang press on. conference. Just don't, I don't want to argue with you about it. That's mm -hmm. cool. I don't know anything what you're talking about. You are, when it comes to US politics, I look to you as being way more knowledgeable than me. What I am telling you, therefore, is this. Congress, House of Representatives, is investigating Trump's team. In doing so, you're talking about being under federal investigation as well by the FBI, Trump and his cohorts. Why then, if you were investigating them, would you take your evidence that you have found and turn it over to Trump's team before even returning it, turning it over to the investigatory body you're working for? Well, that tells me that he's not working for them. Exactly. That's what I said. That basically means <laughs> just... that he was on the transition team, and instead of doing what he's supposed to do for the country and for his committee, he took the information he got, and he went back to his old boss to give him the heads up about what's going on. Okay, you are very eloquent and very fluent at this stuff, okay? I'm, I love the fact that you've allowed me to pull you up, because you drop names like... And I understand that you know who they are and what their allegiances are and yep. what their backgrounds are, but a lot of our listeners don't, especially me. So I'm going to pull you up on these things just for that moment of clarity. Yep. Cool. Okay. So that, does, that does not sound good. No, it does not. So Devin Nunez, chairman of the, of the Intelligence Committee. Yep. Is a Republican. Yep. His counterpart, Adam Schiff. Yep. Is the ranking member and he is a Democrat. Yes. Both parties are represented on this committee. They are investigating coercion between Russia and the Trump team during the past election. Yes. The premise going forward is that the Russians and the Trump team were in collusion, which led to WikiLeaks, 
and all the information that was leaked, which led to the hacking of the DNC, which led to Hillary Clinton's poll numbers going down the gurgler, so to speak, and Trump actually winning the election. It is illegal for a foreign government to interfere in the United States election. Therefore, they are having these hearings to find out exactly what was going on. The FBI comes and testifies to state that Donald Trump's allegation that Barack Obama tapped his phones at Trump Tower is an absolute fallacy. That was also backed up by the NSA, the National Security Organizations, Association, Societies, and it was also backed up by the DOJ, the Department of Justice. They found no evidence that Barack Obama or his party did any wiretapping, any surveillance of Donald Trump during the election or therefore after the election as well. An investigation was going on. What was found was that there was collusion on the side of Donald Trump and the Republicans. This committee is supposed to investigate it. All information is supposed to go to the committee and be, certain information is to be kept secret. The chairman of the committee did not go to the committee with the information he found out that was new. He went to his old employer because he was on Trump's transition team and gave that information to Trump. He did not give it to his counterpart on the committee. He did not give it to any other committee member. He then held a press conference to state this information, which put a cloud over the fact that maybe they were surveilling Donald Trump. It was probably one of the most fascinating things I ever saw. And if this guy remains on this committee, let alone in Congress, I'll be very surprised. Where's this going, Matt? Where will this go? This is going to the fact that, in my humble opinion, there has been some skullduggery afoot in the whole thing. The skullduggery being a lot of people are making a lot of money being able to peddle influence in the United States government. Wasn't he supposed to drain the swamp? He is the swamp. Oh, no. <laughs> so is, what's going on? Swamp. It's really wacky, isn't it? Oh. So that was my fun for the day. I had the most fascinating week listening to all of this. And to be perfectly honest with you, I could not believe what I saw when this guy did this. I was like, what are you kidding? And then you think they're going to come out and they're going to say stuff like, oh, yes, there was a misunderstanding at the committee and all of these kinds of things. I'm hoping I wrote down part of the quote that came from the Democratic side of this after this person did this information. So Here the, were the, the words. This is Team Hillary. This is basically Team Hillary. But the Team Obama. Part, the yeah, 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 going yeah, yeah. forward. The words came out, blew it, pathetic charade, protection racket for Trump. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that was coming out stated on the record by the Democrats. This has been one of the, the most interesting first hundred days of a presidency in the United States. In history. Probably in history. Yeah. In history. Absolutely fascinating stuff. I tell you who you wouldn't want to be. Nikolai Gorokov. Russian name? Yes. Poisoned? Um, no. Well, Nikolai... Le Thrown off a building? <laughs> yes, Matt. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Nik <laughs> Nikolai was... Uh, pretending to be the next cosmonaut. No, he, um, he was thrown out of the window of his fourth floor apartment in Moscow just the other day um, before he was set to testify on behalf of Vladimir Putin's longtime foe, Sergei Maganiski. And Maganiski was murdered eight years ago, but Putin has him posthumously on trial anyway. That actually ties into what I was saying. I know it does because of the person, one of the people they're investigating. But Nikolai survived. Oh. Yes. He somehow survived his steep fall and is in intensive care at the moment. Whether or not he makes it out of hospital, whether the KGB... Gets to him before he can... Changes his pillows for him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Intrigue, skullduggery, spy stuff. Remember the old thing in Mad Magazine, Spy vs. Spy? Yes, I do. Black and white. Yes, exactly. Black and white. But I, I thought... The, the days of the Cold War should have been long behind us. Obviously not. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, this is this has been absolutely fascinating. I have honestly, it has been amazing what um, I have seen going on over there, because it's a worldwide thing. You just mentioned somebody getting thrown off a building, um, other people dying. It ties into. 
um, somebody who was the head of Kemp, Trump's campaign. Yes, I back know. when the first and second debates were oh, going I know. on. Therefore, we haven't seen the end of this. Oh, you haven't even come close. No. Especially now that the um, Democratic arm of this committee stated that they are now operating under the assumption not of circumstantial evidence, but they actually have solid stuff that they're going to bring out about this. It's going to be interesting. Usually when you're guilty, yes. you're quite open to protesting your innocence. Well, as this, this, as these things were going on, um, yeah, but he, was, he gets on Twitter and he goes during the whole thing, during the whole thing, and he, he was quite he was openly, doing a live time, openly protests that he knows nothing about. It's all being, fake news. Yeah, it's all fake news. But he did that, and they talked to him because they were still talking. But it's they not were still fake. talking to the FBI director it's when he was tweeting, and they not, they read him the tweets. It's not fake news. Of course, it's not fake news. It's not fake this is news. what's going on. It's absolutely what's going on. Anyway, Some of this stuff may seem a little bit anal when no, it comes to the different rules and regulations. No. But look, guys, this honestly. It is never a dull moment over there right now. I asked you specifically this week for us not to talk about he, he who shall not be named. And Did we, you? And we have, but that's I had okay. To, I had to. I had to. That's I had to. okay. I had to. I know. I had to. I know. There's more to life than the bloated one. Oh, there might not be if they get their way. It's let's, been interesting, folks. Let's take a break, man. We'll be back after this. Welcome back, guys, to this week's edition of Beyond 3D. Matt and Clint still here in the studios, ready to give you some more really interesting information. So, Clint. What do you got? Oh, being that I just had that tirade, um, I was looking at Mr. Duncan Rhodes' website, and I was looking at Nexus. And on Nexus, I was looking at his news feed. Mm -hmm. There's some fascinating and interesting stories on his news feed. I think I put one up on Time Crystals the other day. Yeah. Was that Dr. Miller? I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look. I'll have to look again. <laughs> I have no clue. I've been running around doing all kinds of stuff. I'm not week. laughing at you. I put it up there and I literally can't remember who I uh, well, borrowed it from. There you go. Well, the stuff I was looking at. Um, I think it was Dr. From, Miller. It was Dr. Miller at the time, Crystals. Yeah, it comes from um, Duncan's site. And uh, thank you, Duncan, for this site because it's a really good spot to go to to find out all different kinds of things. You're talking ancient mysteries. You're talking climate and the ecosystems, consciousness, food, geopolitics, etc., 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 etc. And it's all there for you to look at. My hand is up. Clint. I have a question. Um, anything in regards to Antarctica after our last two weeks of shows? I didn't look for anything okay. in regards to Antarctica per se. That's okay. I, I do have I do have a little bit of something which can you can probably tie into it. So maybe I should start there first. Do you want to go there first or do you want to go there let's, later? Oh, let's, I just said. We'll Your call, my friend. My call? Your call. Let me just go through the other thing that I thought was very interesting because I think it's something here in Australia that we really need to get into as well. It's starting. Um, Israel and Ireland in the past few weeks have both legalized a certain substance called marijuana. Now, a lot of people would go woohoo or something like that depending on what they're thinking, but this is more for something near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. This is for medicinal purposes, medicinal cannabis. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very interesting that certain places, Canada, Israel now, Ireland, certain states in the United States, and Australia are now looking into medicinal cannabis and what can be going on and how it can actually help people. There are people who are going through cancer treatments and still doing chemotherapies, but they're using medicinal cannabis in such a way where they do not get all of the side effects they were used to, they used to be getting from the chemotherapy that they were going through. Epilepsy children. This is giving them relief and actually stopping a lot of the seizures they're going through on a daily basis. It's something that the Australian government has also brought in under very strict regulations to begin with and a lot of trials are going on. That's one of the things I was looking up on the Nexus news feed. Um, I think that's very important what's going on with that. In and along getting people healthy, happy and doing those kind of things, they had a list of what could possibly be, you got it, you'll love this, what are the happiest countries on the planet? They list them. You'd have to think about this. I, I just did. Yes. I, I was just contemplating. Um, well, let's just see if we can do the top five. Netherlands? Um, 
It would probably make the top ten. Okay. But it's not in the top five. But you're close. Okay. Very close. Greenland. Yeah, right. <laughs> All those aliens are really happy. Go for, what is, what's the list? Okay, number one, Norway. Okay. Denmark, number two. Well, well, hang on a minute. What, what did I say? Netherlands? Yeah, that's Denmark and the Netherlands. Two different things. Okay, I suppose it's like saying Australia and New Zealand, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, basically. Yep. Uh, you were close with Greenland, but it was Iceland. Uh-huh. Um, Switzerland. Uh-huh. Finland. Vodka, chocolate. <laughs> There you go. That makes everybody happy, doesn't it? What else? What I wanted to say was Australia, our great land here, came in ninth. Okay. Which isn't bad. It made the top ten. And the good old US of A is 14th, probably heading down to 50th based on what's going on over there right now. But it was very interesting. And the bottom countries were all in Africa and the Middle East. Yeah, you need to look at stress. It's all about stress. It's all about stress. Like, is your infrastructure, is your government infrastructure set up to mm -hmm. accommodate your happiness? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's what it is. Yeah, I agree. I thoroughly and utterly agree. So there was that list. I thought that was very interesting. And if you didn't know, guys, there's about 195 to 196 countries on the planet, depending on whether you want to count Taiwan. Here's what I don't get. Yeah. If a government doesn't look after its population's well-being, mm -hmm. they won't be well enough to go to work mm -hmm. to generate taxes for mm -hmm. the government to have money mm -hmm. so obviously the more you look after your population the more taxes you can recuperate mm. Well, I don't believe in taxes anyway. I know you don't. I don't believe in taxes either. Income it's tax anyway. I believe you... Archaic system. Yeah, it's, it's pathetic. Um, and it's only been around for about 114 or so years, really, because they started paying... You had to pay income tax in the United States in 1913. And so it's really interesting when you get the pundits on television talking about all of the presidents paid their taxes. Well, the only taxes they paid back in the 17 and 1800s were if they were doing commerce. They did not have to pay income tax. But... Oh, well, that's it. Another thing that they had on Duncan's site that I thought was really cool. Are we still talking about marijuana? No, we don't have to. Okay. No, no. We don't have to. Just brought it up. It's things that, guys, you can go to Duncan's site. You can look up these. There's a lot of really good information out there. But medical cannabis, I think, is very important. Um, happiness, very important. One of the things that keeps you happy is your pineal gland and making sure it's decalcified, especially with meditations. So... The top five things that can help you have a very healthy, happy pineal gland. Number one, oregano oil. You can start taking oregano can, oil. Can you say that again, please? A healthy, happy pineal gland. The pineal gland sits in the center of your brain. If you take the tips of your ears and draw a line into your head, and then go from between your eyebrows to the back of your head and draw another line, where those two lines intersect, your pineal gland sits there. Is this ink going to come off? Like, <laughs> Yeah, if you draw <laughs> dots, they'll ultimately come off, as long as you don't use one of those, what do they call those things? The, the, the permanent marker. Permanent marker, as long as you don't use that. No, please do. But so... <laughs> When you meditate, we we did our meditation the other time. We we were activating the pineal gland in the brain. Now you so. said decalcifying that. Yeah. How how would you decalcify that? Basically, what happens is just like around the teeth and stuff like that. If there if it doesn't get cleaned properly, calcification can happen. So what you have to try and do is to make sure it you don't get that buildup. And there are certain things you can take and put into your body, certain supplements that can actually help to keep the pineal gland working, lubricated, and it doesn't have that buildup. On it, like almost like a plaque buildup. So you can use the first one is oregano oil. Oregano oil. Okay. Oil. I do have some of that at home, and um, you can get it in pill form because mm -hmm. it's very harsh on the tongue, and you can swallow that. Really works very well. Raw cacao, as in the poor man's chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, that'll help. Yeah. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Chlorophyll food. Chlorophyll filled foods. Yes. Raw foods. Say anything green. Mm, yeah, that helps. High in green. Yeah. High in green. Uh, apple cider vinegar. Oh, you're going to be tough to knock that stuff down. Yeah, you do. A really good source. Another one is iodine. Nice. Um, and I take that on a daily basis. Just a couple of drops. Nascent iodine. And that helps... I was going to say colloidal, colloidal silver. Colloidal silver also helps. Um, yeah. That's really great when you're sick as yeah. well. If you have a cold or a sore throat or anything like that, just down some of that. That really does help as well. Just don't take too much. You turn purple. No, well, the nascent iodine we take is purple crystals. Mm -hmm. So that's it's really good for you. So those are the kind of things that can uh, help you in your pineal, the pineal gland. Pardon me, the pineal gland. <laughs> your pineal gland, keep it healthy, active, and everything like that. And then when you do your meditations, by activating it, after a while, you will actually feel your brain light up. 
when you do the proper sequence. So that's so just like exercising a muscle, supplements and things like that really help. Um, the reason, in my opinion, the supplements help is because of something. I just saw an article that I thought was very, very interesting. I just wanted to ask you a question because you've been around the world and done, done things like that. Have you ever experienced anything more intense than the sun on this continent known as Australia? Yes. Where? Vegas. You think that the sun in Vegas is worse than the sun here? I'll tell you why. It's different. Mm -hmm. You can walk down the strip in Vegas and you've got the natural sunlight hitting you. Yep. And then you'll walk through an invisible pocket mm -hmm. of energy. Mm -hmm. And what it is, it's the sun hitting a window on one of the big buildings and reflecting back down onto the street. Mm -hmm. And it's like a magnifying glass. So if you can imagine an ant yep. under a magnifying glass, yep. you'd just be walking down the strip and all of a sudden you've gone from a 30 degree pocket of air into a 45 degree pocket of air instantly and it just fries you. Mm -hmm. That kind of intensity mm -hmm. on this planet, mm -hmm. that's about it. That's interesting. I wasn't thinking more of, I wasn't thinking of buildings. I was thinking more along the lines of just a natural situation. But you didn't specify what the well, parameters of this conversation were, okay, Matthew. Okay, therefore, take, if you take that out of the equation, in my opinion at least, maybe you, you, can, you might concur, you might not, I believe, I have never experienced, well I have, but we won't count that. Kuwait can't count because it can get to 50 degrees there easy. Oh yeah. Um, when it's a 24 degree day here, mm -hmm. the sun has a has a certain intensity to it, mm -hmm. a burning quality. To I get sunburned now through through a t-shirt mm. because I've had the, I've had uh, my epidermal layer removed mm -hmm. three times when I was a kid from the sun. Mm. So now I, I suffer intense sunburn even through a t-shirt. Well, well, I was reading an article about this, and the woman was in Europe, but she was talking about the intensity of the sun. Now, last week, mm -hmm. when I played the David Wilcock clip about Antarctica, and mm -hmm. he was referring, he was talking about Buzz Aldrin yeah. slingshotting around the moon. Yeah. And the radiation pill that the astronauts take, which is a polymer mm -hmm. that shields them, their cells from radiation. And they were saying that if you fly any more than three times a year in a jumbo jet, that is a dose of radiation that the body cannot handle. Hmm because of the sun intensity at that level. Hmm. Interesting. Is that anything to go to do with where you're going? No. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> no, but it was interesting this article because this person said the planet it's not global warming and the planet heating up. It's more the planet drying out. Water will be the commodity. Exactly. That's what they're talking about. Yeah. It'll be it'll be the water will be the thing. And uh, the, she's talking about one of the things that's near and dear to your heart that is helping to dry out the planet. Sorry, oh, she's talking about up. A, up in Alaska. Get off the grass. That's what she was talking. Yeah. I, I know we were talking about marijuana earlier, but get off the grass. No, 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 no. That's what she was saying. It's helping to ionize the atmosphere. Yeah, but that's like... Um that's like saying, uh, let's introduce cane toads to Australia to help reduce the pest population. <laughs> well, this is what the article states, you know. It's her article, not mine. I'm just reading it and giving the information out, but I thought it was, I thought it was very fascinating. Uh, bloody harp. Very fascinating indeed. Harp, 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 that too. But she was saying harp and 12 other um, installations that are doing similar things to harp. Bloody, to bloody harp. Yeah. And uh, the other thing that I was just getting into because it happened this past week was the death of the Great One, according to some people. The, I can't say it without laughing. At the laughing. age of 101. The, the withered little reptile man. Looks George, like it when you get the search. Doesn't oh, he? Oh, man. He finally left the building, David Rockefeller. And the thing that struck me anytime I hear that name is what my great uncle used to say when I was a kid about the Rockefellers. And I might have said it before to you, but the Rockefellers were out in Missouri originally, in the Boot Hills, and they had a different name. And the two brothers were named Frank and Jesse James. Okay. And Jesse faked his death, got the money, and moved east. And it is stated that John Rockefeller, the head of Standard Oil, was in fact the great thief 
stage coast robbing crazy man named Jesse James. Faked his death, moved back east, and there you go. Yeah, well, did very well. Wow. As far as that family is concerned. So that is what is supposed to be the truth when it comes to that matter. But David Rockefeller dead at 101. And we have to take a break. Beyond, 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 three, 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 D, 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 D. Welcome back tonight to Beyond 3D. I'm still, I'm still in awe. Oh, well, truth is stranger than fiction. And we've all know, we all know that, so hey, that's the what's that's what's going on with that anyway. So that was the Nexus goodies, as far as I can see. A lot of stuff on there, but uh, it was very it was interesting this week. I was going through a few of those articles. Triple W Nexusmagazine.com. And you can go to the right side of the page and the news feed is there and you can click on it. You can sign up, become a member. It doesn't cost you anything, and they can send you headlined emails and things like that, depending on what you want. You have a choice. Good stuff. Bloody good articles. Yeah, absolutely. Duncan, you do a wonderful job. Indeed. Indeed. Clint. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh Uh-oh, what's he saying now? Well, I I haven't really dug him that much, as in I don't go out of my way to listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson. He likes Star Trek. He can't be all bad. I didn't say he was bad at all. (laughs) I've got a little clip here that I want to play. Okay. Um, Have a listen to this. Just a couple of thoughts. One that's sort of deeply cosmic and another one that is fascinatingly disturbing, I think. You'll be the judge of this. Uh, Consider a couple of fundamental facts that has been gleaned in the past 60 years. That the ingredients, if you had asked your chemistry teacher 50 years ago, once you looked at that mysterious chart of boxes that sat in front of your class, the periodic table of elements, where did those elements come from? The chemistry teacher would actually not have an answer for you. They'll say, well, we dig them out of the earth. That's not where they come from. It took modern astrophysics to determine the origin of the chemical elements. We observe stars. We know what goes on in their center. They explode, laying bare their contents. And what we have discovered is that the elements of the periodic table, that which we are made of, derive from the actions of stars that have manufactured the elements, exploded, scattered their enriched guts across the galaxy, contaminating or enriching gas clouds that then form a next generation of stars populated by planets and possibly life. And so when you look at the ingredients of the universe, the number one ingredient is hydrogen. Next is helium. Next is carbon. Sorry, uh, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. Those are the top ingredients in the universe. So you say, well, okay, that's kind of cool. Well, and you look at Earth, because we like thinking of ourselves as special. We say, oh, we're special. Well, what are we made of? Well, what's the number one sort of molecule in the body? It's, it's water. We, our, it's water. Well, what's water made of? H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Hmm, hydrogen and oxygen. In fact, if you rank the elements in the human body, With the exception of helium, which is chemically inert, you can't die from helium unless that's all you breathe. Um, So, uh, number one in the human body is hydrogen. Matches the universe. Number two is oxygen. Matches the universe. Number three, carbon. Matches the universe. Number four, nitrogen. Matches the universe. And for each of us, the fifth element, other, is the same in both places. Okay? Other. So, we learned in the last 50 years that, of course, not only do we exist in this universe, it is the universe itself that exists within us. And had we been made of some rare isotope of bismuth, you would have arguments, hey, we're something special. But there are people who are upset by that fact, saying, well, that that mean we're not special? Well, I think it's special in another kind of way. Because when you look up at the night sky, It's no longer we're here and that's there. It's that we are part of that. And that association, for me, is actually quite enlightening and ennobling and enriching. In fact, it's almost spiritual, looking up at the night sky and finding a sense of belonging, given what we've learned about the night sky. And so, 
So now we have ourselves. Now are we alone in the universe? We're made of the most common ingredients there are. And our chemistry is based on carbon. Carbon is the most chemically active ingredient in the entire periodic table. If you were to find a chemistry on which to base something really complex called life, you would base it on carbon. Carbon is like the fourth most abundant ingredient in the universe. Isn't that rare? You can make more molecules out of carbon than you can all other kinds of molecules combined. So if we ask ourselves, are we alone in the universe? It would be, in spite of my diatribe about UFOs, I tell you in the same breath that it would be inexcusably egocentric to suggest that we are alone in the cosmos. The chemistry is too rich to declare that. The universe, too vast. There are more stars in the universe than grains of sand in all the beaches of the world. There are more stars in the universe than all the sounds and words ever uttered by all humans who have ever lived. To say we're alone in the universe. No, we haven't found life outside of Earth yet. We're looking. Haven't looked very far yet. <laughs> Galaxies this big, we looked about that far. But we're looking. And how about life on Earth? How, is it hard to form? Just because we don't know how to do it in the lab doesn't mean nature had problems. So it may be, given that information, that given the right ingredients, which are everywhere, life may be inevitable, an inevitable consequence of complex chemistry. If that's the case, we look around our own solar system, we look at Mars. All the evidence suggests that Mars was once a wet, fertile place, an oasis. There are dried riverbeds and floodplains and river deltas and meandering rivers. It's all bone dry now. Something bad happened on Mars. Some knobs got turned in its environment that left it the way it is right now. Some bad knobs got turned on Venus too. Runaway greenhouse effect. You saw the clip on that. 900 degrees Fahrenheit on Venus. Some knobs got turned there too. People say, why spend money up there when we spend it? Because up there, we might learn about down here, okay? I don't want a runaway greenhouse effect here. Venus is the best example in the solar system of a planet gone bad. Let's learn about that first. So, it turns out Mar we learned that asteroid impacts, when they hit, can cast rocks in their surrounding areas into space with escape velocity so they never come back to the planet from which it was launched. If Mars was wet and fertile before Earth was, as all evidence suggests, and if Mars had life before Earth had life, it is possible for there to have been bacterial stowaways in the nooks and crannies of the rocks that were cast into space. There's some hardy bacteria that we already know exists on Earth survives extreme temperatures, pressures, freeze-dried, reconstituted, radiation. The hostile environment of space would be nothing to some of these bacteria. It may be that life on Earth was seeded by bacterial stowaways on rocks that were cast free from Mars. This is a plausible scenario that's called panspermia, the transference of life from one planet to the next. If that's the case, that makes all of us descendants of Martians that I want to alert you in advance. Now, let me give you a disturbing thought, a fascinatingly disturbing thought, and we'll leave you on that note. Uh, if you look at our closest genetic relative to human beings, it would be the chimpanzee. We, we share like 98 plus percent identical DNA. We are smarter than a chimpanzee. So let's invent a measure of intelligence that make humans unique. Let's say intelligence is your ability to like compose poetry, symphonies, do art, math and science, let's say, okay? Let's make that as the arbitrary definition of intelligence for the moment. Chimps can't do any of that. Yet we share 99% identical DNA, okay? The most brilliant chimp there ever was maybe can do a little bit of sign language. Well, our toddlers can do that. Toddlers. So, here's what concerns me deeply. Deeply. Every 
only thing that we are that distinguishes us from chimps emerges from that 1% difference in DNA. It has to, because that's the difference. The Hubble telescope, these grand, that's in that 1%. Maybe everything that we are that is not the chimp is not as smart compared to the chimp as we tell ourselves it is. Maybe the difference between constructing and launching a Hubble telescope and a chimp combining two finger motions as sign language, maybe that difference is not all that great. We tell ourselves it is, just the same way we label our books optical illusions. We tell ourselves it's a lot, maybe it's almost nothing. How would we decide that? Imagine another life form that's 1% different from us in the direction that we are different from the chimp. Think about that. We got 1% difference and we're building the Hubble telescope. Go, one, go another 1%. Yeah. Who, what are we to they? We would be drooling, blithering idiots in their presence. That's what we would be. We would, they would take Stephen Hawking and roll him in front of their, their primate researchers and say, well, this one is like the most brilliant among them because he can do sort of astrophysics in his head. Oh, isn't that cute? Little Johnny can do that too. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> In fact, Johnny just did that. Let me get it. It's, it's, it's on the refrigerator door. Here he is. He did it in his elementary school class. Think about how smart they would be. Quantum mechanics would be intuitive to their toddlers. Whole symphonies would be written by their children and, like I said, just put up on the refrigerator door the way our pasta collages are on our refrigerator doors. <laughs> So the notion that we're going to find some intelligent life and have a conversation with it? <laughs> when was the last time you stopped to have a conversation with a worm? <laughs> or bird? Oh, well, you might have had a conversation, but I don't think you expected an answer, all right? <laughs> so, we don't have conversations with any other species on Earth with whom we have DNA in common. To believe that some intelligent other species is going to be interested in us, enough to have a conversation? They'll look at our Hubble telescope and say, oh, isn't that quaint? Look at what they're doing. <laughs> So I lay awake at nights wondering whether simply we as a species are simply too stupid to figure out the universe that we're investigating. And maybe we need some other species, 1%, 1% smarter than we are, for which strength theory would be intuitive, for which all the greatest mysteries of the universe, from dark matter, dark energy, the origins of life, and all the frontiers of our thought would be something that they would just self-intuit. That was Neil deGrasse Tyson there, Matt. That uh, is a great way of looking at that, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. It's it now. What's going on in my head is I'm thinking one percent, and I'm thinking the differences, and I'm thinking Ooh, that much difference. Well, one percent is drastic. One percent difference in your DNA between you and a chimp is an iPhone. Mm. Is yeah. a CT CAT scan machine. Mm-hmm is a rocket that takes you to the moon. Right. That 1% difference. Is multiple languages. Multiple languages. Multiple mathematics. 1%. String string theory is the 1% difference between us and a chimpanzee. Mm. The knowledge or trying to ascertain logically what string theory is. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. what kind of life forms are out there that are 1% different from us or even 10% different from us? At 10% different, how can we send a radio signal out and expect them to communicate with us? What kind of, that, their tech would just be so far advanced. It reminds me of the what they used to say in the old scriptures about certain beings 
and the fact that these beings, if you were to come too close to them, not out of malice, but just out of what they are, we would be that ant, and they could just <coughs> walk by, step on you, you're done, and wouldn't even know that they had done it. It's very interesting. Very interesting indeed. We'll be back with more in a moment. Beyond, 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 three, 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 day, 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 day. Welcome back to Beyond 3D for this week. Clint, I see you diligently writing over there and stuff like that there. What else you got? Earth's Schumann resonance is accelerating. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Everybody start meditating. Start thinking about what you truly want and what you need to leave behind. Do you know what the Earth heartbeat is? No. What hurts? It's 7.83. Okay. Now, that's with the Indian rishis mm -hmm. called um, the Om. Right. What can you tell me about that? Om. Well, I know that you know, more, you know more about that than I do. You, it's Basically, it's the primordial sound. Everything comes from it. And if you think about this, I'll tell it to you the way one of my teachers in the Philippines told it to us. He says, think about chanting Om. Now, most of us, if you do a meditation, you know, Om. You chant the syllable. But you hear it all the time. If something's about to happen and you see something that can shock you, we use... The words O oh, with a bleep behind it. But that O. Oh. The same thing when people are having sex, sexual relations. What are they doing? What are they saying? Turning it, oh, different ohms and things like that. It's a primordial sound. It is the vibration. Can you just do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing while I'm not even looking at you while you're doing that. All I heard was the. <laughs> so they do all these kind of things. So this is what goes on with it. And so it is the primordial sound, but it is also the source. God is Om, as far as the Indians are concerned, as far as India is concerned. That is, that vibration creates what we see on this light spectrum. So that's the 7.83 hertz. Mm -hmm. So the Schumann resonance, which is what that is called, mm -hmm. has recently been detected spiking at 8.5 hertz, which it doesn't do. Hmm. So it sounds to me like the planet's either talking, waking up, or grumbling. When the Brahmin priests chant, Svadhyaya they call it, what they do is they intone it in certain frequencies. We know them musically as certain key signatures. Um, normally they would be chanting either in the key of G or the key of D. Um, but I digress. There is a certain resonance that comes when you chant at certain frequencies, and it can affect certain parts of the body. And so the earth is alive, as far as most of us are concerned, and therefore it will have a certain resonance. And what can happen is, like everything, its frequency can start to vibrate at a higher level. So it makes sense that it would move up. But I think what we need to do now is get one of those machines and we can just hear that 7.83 and then we can hear 8.5 and hear the difference. I'm going to have to think about that. I, I, I do have a sound tone generator yeah. app. Mm -hmm. I'll have a look at that next week. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let me see if we can find much idea. of a difference between the two. Mm. But uh, it, as you said just a little while ago, it doesn't have to be much of a difference. It could be 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. can lead to quite a bit. When, we were, when you were saying that before, the first thing that came to my mind is the different when we're all driving, because most of us drive, it's someone traveling at 100 kilometers an hour and someone traveling at 101 kilometers an hour and after an hour you yeah. step out of the vehicle and you're a kilometer away from each other exactly interesting to me now think of that in terms of the solar system mm. yeah fascinating stuff fascinating stuff. speaking of which mm -hmm. stephen hawking has figured out how to escape a black hole <laughs> Did this you ought just, to be good. Did you just laugh because yeah. of the image of him in a wheelchair? <laughs> no. Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> so, see, that's the thing. I like, where do you go, like, politically correct with that when you're referring to that? Do you go down Family Guy Road? <laughs> yes. Or, or you do. Okay. <laughs> 
Seth MacFarlane, yes. Do I need to read this in his voice? <laughs> no, you don't have to. Well, that's what you just said. I'm asking well, go you. Ahead. you, you can, oh, so who are you? You're no, Howard, no, no. Now you're Howard from Big Bang. Yes, you can read it in his voice as well. Because no, he does, I, he does a really good uh, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, yes. Do they? I don't watch that show either. Oh, they. Do they? Oh, in. in they do the, the whole. They, imperson- they impersonate. Yes, they right, do. Okay. Yes, they do. Um. See, I don't want to read it now. I don't want to make fun of the guy. Then read it in the normal voice, and don't worry. About <laughs> okay. It. Um, Stephen Hawking has figured out, Matt, mm-hmm. how to escape a black hole. Mm-hmm. He says that matter that falls <laughs> into a black hole. <laughs> time, maybe. <laughs> No, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're serious or not? It was rude. That's a joke. Inside, forget it. No, forget it. Go ahead. Matter that falls into a black hole, Mm -hmm. according to Stephen Hawking, is forever gone. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, not quite, says Stephen Hawking. He has told students in a public lecture in Stockholm, Sweden recently, that if you feel you're in a black hole, don't give up. There's a way out. Which is... You possibly know that black holes are stars that have shrunken under their own strong gravity, Mm -hmm. generating gravitational forces so powerful that even light cannot escape them. Right. Anything that falls inside is believed to be torn apart by the immense gravity, never to be seen or heard from again. However, what you may not know is that physicists have been arguing for 40 years about what happens to the information about the physical state of those objects once they fall in. Okay. According to quantum mechanics, this information cannot be destroyed, but Einstein's theory, general relativity, says it has to be. That's why this disagreement is recognized as the information paradox. Now, (laughs) according to Hawking, this information never makes it inside the black hole in the first place. Hawking said, I'm not going to do this in here, I'll, I'll try and do it in his voice. I propose that the information is stored not in the interior of the black hole, as one might expect, but on its boundary, the event horizon. Hawking is proposing, Matt, that the information about particles fleeting through is interpreted into a type of hologram, a 2D depiction of a 3D object that sits on the surface of the event horizon. Hawking finishes that by saying the idea is a super translations are a hologram of the ingoing particles, thus they contain all the information that would otherwise be lost. Mm-hmm. I have to think about that for about five weeks, and then maybe I'll be able to give you a response. Have you seen the film Event Horizon with Sam Neill? No. Eons ago, wouldn't it have been? I tell you what I really dig about that film, they yeah. go up to the event horizon of a black hole. Yeah. And Sam Neill on his arm patch has an Australian flag. Right. Actually, no, from memory, it's the Aboriginal flag. Okay. On his arm patch. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. The one thing about that film I remember. Hmm. But if information is sitting on the edge of of an event horizon, then it's neither in or out. Well, that's kind of like Schrodinger's cat, isn't it? Schrodinger's cat, yeah. Yeah, I, I personally, you know... It doesn't do my head in, but the fact of the matter is, uh, I think what it comes down to with science is they're dealing in absolutes. He's still working within the boundaries of scientific method. And in order to truly understand it, I think you have to go outside that boundary. Well, that's what we were talking the other day about Mm -hmm. um, science trying to quantify and qualify the meaning of let's just call it xyz but they're only using scientific ways to do it they're not taking into account the spiritual either Mm -hmm. which cannot be quantified and qualified Mm -hmm. and that's the whole thing so it's interesting that at least he well at least he doesn't think you get obliterated anymore Um, but the information can remain we're we're taking this the word of just one man who hasn't been in there I mean he's using the maths but yeah that's the whole point but the whole point is there's other maths that we haven't discovered yet Mm mhm or we haven't discovered, others have discovered, we haven't come across that maths yet. So who's to say your head doesn't this collapse is this, in... This is the whole thing. It has. I, you don't even have to talk about science. This is with anything. It's about doing something, the theoretical aspect of things, as opposed to the actual doership. You can talk all you want about, for argument's sake, flying a plane. 
you can understand from the classroom aerodynamics, you can understand what an aileron is, you can understand propeller, you can understand engines, you can understand drag and lift. Easily understood. It's a totally different experience when you get behind the yoke of an airplane and take the thing in the air. It's a totally different experience. So, theoretically, we can understand a lot of things, but as you just said, you have to be there. You have to get there to see exactly what's gonna happen, and until that happens, which it won't, we really won't know. No. Anything can happen. No. Yeah. So, thanks, Hawk. Thanks, Hawk. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. We'll be back after this break, Matt, with a little bit more. Cool. Beyond, 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 three, 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 ding, 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 ding. Welcome back, guys, to this week's edition of Beyond 3D. Matt and Clint still here with you in the Mornington Peninsula studios at RPP 98.7, 98.3. Somebody must be listening because they let us back every week. Yeah, I guess, guess you're right. <laughs> anyway, we wanted to, um, there was a couple of things. I put up a small video on our Facebook page from Mr. Slattery, Peter Maxwell Slattery. Good evening, Pete. How are you going, Pete? Beautiful Melbourne sky and an absolutely stunning violet pink UFO that he captured. I want to know what camera he uses, number one. Next time we talk to him, we'll have to ask him about the equipment that he uses. But it was absolutely fascinating. And the thing I like about the way he does it is you're looking at a, just a crystal clear blue sky. And as you zoom in, you start to see th you start to see that there's more up there than you could possibly imagine. So it was absolutely fascinating to look at. But uh, you guys can take a look at that on our Facebook page. But the other thing that I think is just as important is the fact that Peter has a new book out. He does. It's called The Book of Shiji 2. 2. Um, and Pete's got that on Amazon Australia at the moment, and it's... Right in, next to my book. Hello? Right next to my book. My it, book's on Amazon. Oh, it? yeah. Sorry, Matt. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, his book's in the top 100 at the moment in three different areas on America's Amazon as well. Excellent. So, we wish you all the best with that, Pete. And Absolutely. I'm pretty sure the book of Shiji, number three, he's probably working on at this point in time as well. I would think so. Um, let's think put so. a link to that. We will. We'll put a link up to that so you guys can take a look at Pete's book and uh, get out there and get that support people who are actually doing really good work because he's doing some really fascinating stuff. So, what else, Clint? Um, Large Hadron Collider just discovered five new particles. Have they named them yet? Yes, they have named them. Hmm. Do you want me to read them? No. Okay. I just want to know if they named them. Yeah, they've named them. Eeny, meeny, miny, and mo. You're not too far off. <laughs> You're not too far off. Oh, look, they, you know, they're going to run out of names with all this kind of stuff. Just like that ravioli planet going around Saturn right now. Yeah, look, you said that to me last week. I'm like, yeah. what are you talking about, ravioli? Yeah, it looks like it. Pan. Absolutely. Um, Vatican. Their fun little thing called the time machine, their chronovisor. Yes. Um, the CIA, um, there was a little blurb from the CIA um, talking about the fact that the Vatican actually turned it over to them in the 60s for the technology. Yes. Interesting. Yes. One of the little stories going on out there I thought would uh, just bring it up and everybody can start doing a little bit of research to see if uh, certain things are going on. I don't know who would have the best collection of dirty secrets. The Vatican? The Smithsonian. Vatican. Do you really? Yeah. They've been around longer than the others. And when you go back in time to see who yeah. was actually Pope. Hang on a tick. Yeah. I'd agree with you on one part. Yeah. But on the other part, I wouldn't. Because the Smithsonian have deep pockets. And a lot of the old stuff has been turning up in the new era. Mm -hmm. So I would assume that Smithsonian would swoop in and take most of the stuff with a checkbook. Now, yeah, but there's certain things that the Vatican has their hands on, in my opinion, that the Smithsonian would probably die for, but they're never going to be able to get it. That's just the way it is. They go back like, a little like, bit Like further. what? Give me oh, one. Just the, little, just the little gold and the trinkets and everything that they could have found. The fact that, in my opinion, certain religions were actually written by certain popes to keep certain parts of the world in check. Are we talking about like the omission of the Book of Enoch? 
Yeah, Enoch one. Islam another. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, a few things like that. Um, so, yeah, I believe that, well, look, I can give you the Smithsonian as well. I think they, they did a lot of interesting things going back in the 18 and early 1900s as far as collections and things like that. But the Vatican has been around a long time, and most of the popes were corrupt um, going back. And so, hey, a lot of things were going on back then. A lot of artifacts were more than likely stored away. I think what you got um, with the Smithsonian and with the aid, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, is the fact that, yeah, the Smithsonian and government took in a lot of interesting things. and did, I, They did have deep pockets. They did go around the world and grab a lot of goodies. And, uh, hang on, I think hang on. I've just... I've just gone, stood in the corner while you were talking, had a little bit of a thing to myself. Okay. We're talking the Vatican. Yeah. Vatican City. They are their own state. Now they are. The Smithsonian doesn't have their own state. The amount of gold yeah. and artifacts, yeah. priceless artifacts that the Vatican would have in its catacombs. Oh, yeah. They have a lot. They'd have a lot. They have a heck of a lot. The, the actual land, the Vatican City, the, they actually procured that land you, with the help of two very interesting fellows. One named Mussolini, the other named Hitler. Um, that's how they got the land called Vatican City. Um, in my opinion, I think they would have done certain favors for those two shall we say, nefarious people. And uh, I think there's a lot of things hidden in a lot of different places. Add to this if you can. Mm -hmm. Last year, yep. we were talking about how exorcisms have gone up. Mm -hmm. The Vatican has an, observ an observational telescope mm -hmm. called Lucifer yep. that has successfully detected alien life not of this planet in the infrared spectrum mm -hmm. what else hmm. what else is it detected what else what else is the vatican doing you just talked about the chrono the chronovisor the chronovisor the yeah. time chronovisor yeah so they've got a time machine now as well allegedly yeah so we're talking about exorcisms have gone up mm -hmm. they have a telescope that detects alien life in the infrared spectrum mm -hmm. and you were just talking about a chronovisor time machine in possession of the vatican yes just you know i'm pulling bob off the street and i'm sitting down with him and i'm yeah. giving him these three bits of information right make sense of this map okay chronovisor don't think you're going to step in and you and your body are going to all of a sudden be transported somewhere. Think of a television screen that can actually see what's going on in time over certain periods of time. That's I just, the way I would think of it. I just remembered something now to complement what you're talking about. Where did you get this information from? Which part? The chronovisor. There was an article talking about the Vatican and all the different things it had and going back to the 60s at the Second Vatican Council under Pope John the 23rd. This information was shared with the CIA. Andrew Basciago, yeah, who we ran two shows on last year, yep. talked about viewing a chronovisor. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty he sure did. from memory it was in Italy. Mm -hmm. and it, No, actually it wasn't. It was at Langley. Mm. And he got to see the crucifixion of Christ mm. on the chronovisor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, according to him, he actually can go through and physically be in the past. We're talking about Basciago. Yeah, Basciago. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about that. He also talked about being part of a Mars Jump Group program with Barry Satoro. Yeah, no, I don't know about that either. Um, but a chronovisor looking, having, if you think about it, light spectrum. If you could have a device that could peer through different spectrums and all of a sudden you take that time component away and it can just above the time component and stick itself back down into the timeline somewhere and you can look at a television screen and you could see what was going on at certain points in certain places. Yeah, and if you really could control it, you could go back in time to see the Battle of Hastings in 1066 and what was going on back then. You could go back in time and see the early dynasties of the Chinese. Um, you could go back in time and see 
Krishna at the end of the what was it called? The Satcha Yuga or the Dwapara Yuga? At the end of the Dwapara Yuga, and you could see him actually having his war with the warrior castes on Kurukshetra in northwestern India. A lot of stuff you could go and see. It'd be fascinating to see, personally. So uh, I believe that um, there is certain information out there, there are certain devices out there that can be used to the advantage of certain entities, certain governments. I think the Smithsonian, as you stated, has a lot of interesting technologies that they will that will never see the light of day. I think the Vatican has interesting technologies that will never see the light of day as well. And I think some interesting technologies are held in private hands that will be used to their advantage. Way of the world. I was just thinking about one of those crazy ball bearing spinners that are on the market at the moment for people that have OCD. Mm hmm. Oh, you were talking about interesting devices that are held in Obsessive private hands. Disorders. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a lot going on with that this week, just as far as reading is concerned. Um, I'm amazed at some of the different UFO sightings that have been going on worldwide these days. Yes, we've talked about Antarctica over the past few weeks. Um, and more and more information is going on there. One of those ice shelves just broke off and they stated that they had to evacuate everybody and their mother, basically. Because Antarctica is not big enough just to move to a new location. Everybody has to be evacuated because a chunk of ice is broken off. Yes. Everybody, the they work. Every, everybody just leave. Yeah. Get out for a while. In other words, we have stuff to do. We don't need you seeing it. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. That's what's really going on. And so they will send in certain military personnel. Those personnel will do Army Corps of Engineers, etc. They will do certain works. They will be sworn to secrecy. And life will go on. I find the synchronicity around Antarctica just fascinating mm. and, and I'm going to lay this out in this manner mm-hmm. David Wilcox interview yep. in regards to him being told externally you have to get this information out as fast as you can yep. so he's worked on it and worked on it and worked on it and put it out to the masses mm-hmm. and then two hours later it broke on mainstream news right We've been beating on about Antarctica for three years, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we did two shows on it back to back, Mm -hmm. and what happened this week? What did you find happened this week after we did our Antarctica stories? Oh, it's in the news. It's in the news. Absolutely. It's in the news, and I find the synchronicity of that just amazing. Look, there's going to be a lot more coming out um, because of what's going on in the world, and uh, I think it's necessary. Once that place... I'll put my, I'll use the word carefully. Once that place defrosts, a lot of interesting things will start to happen. And that's exactly what it's doing right now. Defrosting. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it's being all removed at the same time. Yeah, well, they're trying, but they're not going to, there's certain things that, that are there that will not be able, they can't remove them. It's going to be along the lines of the pyramids. I was just about to say, it's like shifting the Pyramid of Giza on a battleship, isn't it? Yeah, not going to happen. So they're going to do their best to cover it up and hide things, but there are certain things that are immovable. Imagine if they sunk it. Interesting. I don't know how they would do that. Well, they can't fly it out. No. So why not sink it? It's going to be a lot of water. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I didn't call it Atlantis for nothing. Hmm. So we will see what happens, but uh, that's what, in my opinion, is going to come up. <laughs> they're going to find out exactly what was there, and it's they're not going to be able to stop it. And that's what we've got time for this week, Matt. That was a really quick show tonight. Mm, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Well, I'll have some things for next week that uh, we're going to have to go over. Um, it is going to be fascinating when we get back next week, because there's going to be some stuff that's going to happen on this planet in the next week that's going to... All I'm going to do is say, I told you so. So we will t- get back together with you next week for another edition of Beyond 3D. And as we go out tonight, I'm going to leave this with you. This is Jim Two Birds mm-hmm. talking about the Sasquatch people. Ooh, nice. Good night, everybody. Good night. Uh, we say, as a matter of fact, that the Sasquatch and the Yei are our human beings' original ancestors, and that it was from the Yei and the Sasquatch that the ETs biogenetically re-engineered us to give the Adama, or the person, the humanoids that we've become. 
and things. And that's one of the reasons why the Sasquatch and the Yay won't have anything to do with human beings now, you know. And we also say that, it, that when they begin to reappear and show themselves and begin to communicate with human beings again, which is what they're in fact doing now, certain select people we say are being touched by spirit and the Sasquatch are being guided to them to give them special messages about the closing and the end of this fourth cycle because there's a beginning, another cycle that's going to be starting in the very near future for us. And so the Sasquatch are beginning to reveal themselves and beginning to reveal information and secrets, if you will, that they've long held for themselves, for us, about ourselves and things and what, what we need to be prepared for and what we need to be doing, you know, to help heal this Mother Earth, this planet and things. Unfortunately, a lot of people equate the Sasquatch and the Yei, you know, with the ETs. And I've had a lot of people ask me about that. And from my understanding of it, from them themselves, they watch these ETs because from the first ones, they remember in their genetic memory, they remember when they first came. And when they went out to see them, went out to greet them, basically, the first thing that happened was the ETs enslaved them, you know, and tried to use them, you know, to, to do their labor, and they tried to use them for food and, and everything else. They've, they've never been known to harm or eat a human being or anything else in their... Uh, that doesn't mean that they won't defend themselves and stuff, or that they don't get angry, but uh, basically they're very peaceful, peaceful people, and they are our ancestors. There's uh, also some misunderstanding. I always talk in terms of Sasquatch and Yei, and there's actually two different, two different kinds of Yei you find here in the desert, uh, in the river valleys, in the swamps and things. And the Sasquatch are primarily the high mountain people and stuff, and they're much larger than the Yei. Uh, when I went down to Australia, uh, it was really funny because I asked Aboriginal people down there, I says, do you have do you have the equivalent to our Sasquatch and, and, and Yei? And they said, oh yeah, yeah, we do. And they said, they laughed and they said, the white people call them Yowies. And I said, why do they call them Yowies? And they said, well, because every time they see one, they go, Yowie! Just because you haven't experienced it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. 